Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on Christian education. This is lesson number four in that series entitled, The Eyes of the Lord, end quote, The Biblical Worldview. It's the lesson for October 24 of 2020. So, as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we are so grateful that you have made things as clear as possible. We have messed things up so many times, but we're thankful for your guidance and your direction, especially the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Be with us now as we are seeking to, 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 to learn more about you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How do you know if what you think is true is really true? There are many strange ideas floating around in our world today. Is it true that things we believe about our world are actual fact? Well, let's be honest. For at least 2,000 years, it was believed that our world was the center of the universe. Some people even thought that our world was flat. Today, thousands of the best educated humans in the world believe man evolved from simple one-celled organisms. What do they, why do they believe such things? I have been listening to a series of lectures by a, a incredible chemist, uh, and he has invented all kinds of things and worked with these tiny little chemical compounds and so forth like that. And he comes out and he says, if you've worked with those things like I have, and you think that, I mean, not talking about big creatures, if you think that even a cell could have happened by, by chance, you're a loony. There's just no, no possible way. He, he, he gives statistics, you know, one chance out of 79 billion, I mean, more, more numbers, so bigger than the number of atoms in the entire universe. The, uh, by the way, if I can, the entire universe has uh, particles. These are neutrons, electrons, and protons. All together is 10 to the power of 80. Yeah. Wow. Known universe. Yeah. So, over time, every one of us develops a paradigm or world view. This paradigm is, one, is our own mind's way of trying to fit all of our known facts together into a consistent picture. If some idea comes along, that we cannot fit it into our traditional thinking, our minds will often just reject it. Think of the disciples after spending years with Jesus as they are walking up from Jericho to Jerusalem one week before Jesus was tried, beaten, and crucified. Jesus called them aside and said to them, Luke 18, 30. 1 to 34. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. And he, what did the disciples think was going to come true? That they, he was going to take uh, charge and become their leader. Exactly. They were on their way up. The whole group was celebrating. We're on our way up to Jerusalem and we're going to crown him king. Make him king. Mm-hmm. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and insult him and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. American Bible Society, Good News Translation, 2nd edition. Okay, so now, do you think God was hiding it from them? No, it was their paradigm. It was their paradigm. They were so so certain that Jesus was going to become king. They heard these words. Whoosh. Yeah. They, I mean, these are his disciples. They jumped his to closest. Yeah, yeah, they jumped to a conclusion. Yeah. yeah. But it was true also with the, the, the priests and, yeah. and the Pharisees. I mean, they had studied the law yeah. their entire life. They should have known it word, you know. Yes. Well, they memorized it. They did. Yeah. But, I mean, they saw nothing. Yeah. The words were meaningless to them. Yeah. So this was uh, shortly after he brought Lazarus out of the grave. This was not too long after he'd raised Lazarus from He the was dead. on the way to Jerusalem. He went through 
Jericho. He he was so. preaching down on the other side of the Jordan because he didn't dare preach in in in, in right. Judea. So he's preaching on the other side of Jordan, and then he got the message that that Lazarus was dying. He carried four days. And he, so he rushed he was yes, on the way. He rushed over. And but then he went back. This was this was two or three months before. And then he went back overseas, and then now he's on his way up to for crucifixion. So that's about two or three months ago. Because, yeah. because they, then uh, Caiaphas made a tremendous prediction. It yeah. is expedient that one man should die for, and they, no one no one understood. Yeah. There's an Oxford University professor who has theorized that our world is nothing more than a bunch of digital creations controlled by a race of aliens <laughs> with superpower computers somewhere else in the universe. Aren't you glad that you're a digital creation? <laughs> well, there are two very contradictory explanations of our world's existence. One view holds that everything we see and are is purely material, purely natural result of chemical and biological forces without any guidance. Democritus was a Greek philosopher who lived between 460 and 370 BC. He was known as the, the laughing philosopher. So about 2,500 years ago when he lived, he said in his Diogenes Laertius in Democritus volume 9, par paragraph 44, the atoms in the vacuum were the beginning of the universe and that everything else existed only in opinion. <laughs> so the people who think they've come up with some new ideas, it's as old, older than Christ. Well, the Christians have a better worldview. It is broader, deeper, and has many more aspects to it than that empty space that Democritus talked about. So what does the Bible tell us about our origins? I'm going to read four different texts. I'll start with Psalm 53, verse 1. Fools say to themselves, there is no God. They are all corrupt, and they have done terrible things. There is no one who does what is right. Mm -hmm. That comes from the American Bible Society, the 1992 edition of Good News Translation. Moving on, Proverbs 15.3. The Lord sees what happens everywhere. He is watching us, whether we do good or evil. That's from the Good News Bible. We move from... To John 3.16, For God so loved the world, so much he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have e e eternal life. Again, the Good News Bible. Moving to Isaiah 45.21, Come and present your case in court. Let the defendants consult one another. Who predicted long ago what would happen? Was it not I, the Lord, the God who saves his people? There is no other God. That's wow. from the Good News Bible. I, I love that. I love that passage. Yeah. God, and you, if you know the, that passage in, in, in Psalm, in, I mean in Isaiah, starting with chapter 40 up to 55, God just lays it out there. He says, if you think you're a God, tell me, predict hundreds of years in advance what's going to happen. Pre create something out of nothing. Those are his two big arguments. And he, there's some smaller arguments, but the two big ones if you think you're a god, show me how you can create something out of nothing. Predict something years in advance. Okay? I think verse 18 there he says that he created the world to be inhabited. Mm -hmm. He didn't create it a chaos. He created it to be inhabited. I, I yeah. think verse, verse 18. There is more to creation than just the idea that God created us. What kind of a god is he? Is it really true that a personal god loves us and is willing to interact with us? Is he the God who gave the laws that we should live by? The great controversy is all about what kind of a person God is. Satan realizes that if people know the truth about God, he, Satan, will lose. Therefore, Satan is doing everything he can to misrepresent God. Will we fall for his lies? The earth was dark through misapprehension of God that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God. Satan's po deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service 
of love. The love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. And I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. In our discussion last week, we talked a little bit about the fact that only Satan tries to coerce. God will not try to force you. He gives you freedom. He lets you make your choice. He will love. He will, he will appeal. He will do everything. But force is not part of God's government. That's why this Star Wars business is, is a false paradigm. Because the force be with you. Mm -hmm. God doesn't force. Mm -hmm. So it's the antithesis of love. And kids and grown-ups fall for it. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, generations. How many generations since that thing? It's been at least 40 years or 50, close, yeah. 50 years. So you've got a yeah. couple generations. They've been infected with that. To know God is to love Him. His character must be made manifested in contrast to this character of Satan. This work only one being in the universe could do. The only he who knew the height and the depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, Ellen White, Desire of Ages, uh, page 22 of paragraph 1. Okay, this is almost the first paragraph in the book Desire of Ages where she talks about a life of Christ. And what does she say is the purpose of that whole life here? Correct the misapprehension, misrepresentations of Satan about God. Jesus came to tell us the truth about God. Wow. I think that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the punchline of uh, Graham Maxwell. Yeah. God is not the kind of God Satan has accused him to be. That's what I took from him. Yeah. In actual fact, atheistic worldviews are very narrow and limited. The biblical worldview is all about reality, and there is a whole universe full of it. Many years ago, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz asked the question, why is there something instead of nothing? And how should Christians answer that question? Well, I'm, uh, we can start with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, when, when God created the universe. So, why is there something and not nothing? God created a universe. And it goes on, if we had time to read all those passages, it talks about the Sabbath as a memorial of what God has created and so forth. These passages are just a few samples of what the Bible says about God. Notice very interestingly that the Bible does not engage in long arguments to explain God's existence. It just assumes it. Exodus 3, 13-14 But Moses replied, When I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? So what am I to tell them? God said, I am who I am. This is what you must say to them. The one who is called I Am has sent me to you. Wow. Mm. I, I wonder what, you know, I, I wonder what Moses thought when that conversation was over. And I'm sure that what we have here is not the whole conversation. I'm sure there was more. But, wow, 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 wow. So why do you think that encounter with Moses that God called him, in that encounter, why God called himself I Am Who I Am? It's actually, in Hebrew, it's a verb. How many people do you know that are named verbs? Yeah. Well, sometimes it's translated the eternal one, the everlasting one. But without an understanding of God as our creator, what would we do with our understanding of the atonement, the law, the cross, even resurrection and the second coming? Creation is also a very central part of Adventist beliefs. God, in fact, asks us to spend one-seventh of our lives, one day every week, to remember the seventh-day creation week and all that it implies. He does not make that kind of demand for any other teaching. So did God think that that was a pretty important teaching? Yep. I'm sure he did. Yeah. But how, how, how do I even explain it? How horrible it is that... Uh, uh, Christians, well-meaning Christians, 
yeah, we keep all the law, all the law of God is fine, but that one we don't need. Yeah. Fourth commandment, we really truly really don't need. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be studying with, you know, Bill Bunnell by any chance? Mm. Bill Bunnell? Oh, yes. He was the ortho, chief of the ortho. Yeah, we studied together. Revelation, we're studying, you know, and uh, he, everything is fine. Everything is okay, but, you know, we don't need to keep the Sabbath. Yeah. Well, think of how much difference a biblical worldview makes to our thinking. Take, for example, the simple rainbow. Atheistic materialists see raindrops and sunlight being refracted. That's all. But Christians know about the story of the flood and they see evidences for God's promise. Look at Genesis 9, 13 to 16. I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be the sign of my covenant with the world. Whenever I cover the sky with clouds and the rainbow appears, I will remember my promise to you and to all the animals that a flood will never again destroy all living beings. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between me and all living beings on earth. How great, that's from the Good News Bible, how great the condescension of God and his compassion for his erring creatures in this placing the and thus placing the beautiful rainbow in the clouds as a token of his covenant with men. It was God's purpose that as the children of after generations should ask the meaning of the glorious arch which spans the heavens, their parents should repeat the story of the flood and tell them that the Most High had bended the rainbow and placed it in the clouds as an assurance that the water should never again overflow the earth. Patriarchs and Prophets 106. Hmm. Has there ever been another flood like that? Was God's promise valid? Yes. Now, if you were in uh, some parts of the South, as some of these hurricanes come through, you might wonder. <laughs> I was just thinking, yeah. Too. So, what kind of an impact does it have on our day-by-day -day thinking to have a biblical worldview, Jim? Ephesians 6:12. For we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. Mark 13, 7. And don't be troubled when you hear the noise of battles close by, the, close by and news of battles far away. Such things must happen, but they do not mean that they do not mean that the end has come. Romans 5, 8. But God has shown us how much he loves us. He was while, excuse me, it was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. Uh, I'll read from uh, Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose, from the Good News Bible. Move to Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. Yes, the living know they are going to die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. They are completely forgotten. Again, from the Good News Bible. We move to Revelation 20, verses 5 and 6. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first raising of the dead. Happy and greatly Blessed are those who are included in this first raising of the dead. The second death has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with him for a thousand years. Again, from the Good News Bible. Think of the reasons why our biblical worldview is very important to us. How many things would we know nothing about if we did not have the Bible? They include creation, heaven, God himself, the plan of salvation, the second coming of Christ, and the third coming of Christ, just to mention a few. More than that, there are many teachings of the Bible that are in direct contradiction with current thinking in our world. The Sabbath versus Sunday. Creation versus evolution. The nature of man, the state of the dead versus the different views on that. And for God's judgment versus Satan's lies, just, I mean, I'm just touching on all the differences. There are so many of them. But we need to recognize that all of Scripture is tied together. Um, 
I have found many times that someone asks a question about something, if you have enough time, you can go from here to there to there to there to there to there and there and, you know, you can go on forever, just tying all of Scripture together. But we need to recognize that all of Scripture is tied together. Our beliefs about creation, especially as presented in the New Testament, are coupled with the doctrine of redemption. Incredible as it may seem, we realize from the Bible that the one who created us actually came down, lived as a human being, and died for us. But that same individual rose from the dead by his own power, returned to heaven, and will be our judge in the last day. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, time, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made the heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. That's from the New King James Version. If we get to know the truth about God's character and His love, is it any surprise that we would want to worship Him? And guess what the devil doesn't want? That's exactly what he doesn't want. And as incredible as that first coming was, time that we know about His first coming, and is important in our understanding of God, there was no reason for Christ to come the first time if he's not coming back. Stop and think about it. But as we know, the law of God is being attra attacked from every side. Years ago in France, the nation was debating the question of capital punishment. Should it be abolished? Advocates for the abolishment contacted a famous French writer and philosopher named Michael Foucault and asked him to pen an editorial on their behalf. What he did, however, was advocate not for abolishing just the death penalty, but for abolishing the whole prison system entirely and letting all the prisoners go free. Why? Because for Michael Foucault, all systems of morality were merely human constructs, human ideas put in place by those in power in order to control the masses. Hence, these moral codes had no real legitimacy. Wow. From our Bible study guide. Has it come to life? Some similarities say today. We're seeing <laughs> a little of that now, aren't we? I wonder why everybody's all of a sudden noticing the similarities. <laughs> <laughs> In light of that, what could happen to our world if everyone as individuals or even as nations decided to do just whatever they wanted to do? Think about these verses from the Bible, Deuteronomy 12.8. When that time comes, you must not do as you have been doing. Until now, you've all been worshiping as you please. Judges 17.6. There was no king in Israel at that time. All the people did just as they pleased. And verse 20, 21, verse 25, the same thing, basically. There was no king in Israel at that time. All the people did just as they pleased. Uh, however, this was the third theocritic time, though. It was supposed to be. It, it was supposed to be, but they rejected it. Mm -hmm. And when they cried, they said, well, I told you so. Yeah. Yeah. Proverbs twelve fifteen. Stupid people always think they're right. Wise people listen to advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all the people who think that, well, we'll do what we, what we, what we please to do, they're just being foolish. So how should we regard God's love? Is it a restriction on our freedom? What does it say to us about moral conduct in our lives? Jim? Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Mark 12, 29 to 31. Jesus replied, the most important one is this. Talking about laws. Yeah. Listen. Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second most important commandment is this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no other commandment more important than these two. Revelation 14, 12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people. 
those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay, so God has given us his law. It gives us directions about how we should relate to him. Carrie? Uh, reading from Romans 3, verse 20. For no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law does is to make people know that they have sinned. Wow. So Seventh-day Adventist education must be based on our understanding of God's law. In fact, Ellen White talked about the perpetuity of the law, which of course includes the teaching about the Sabbath. And what happens to people when they reject God's law? In rejecting the truth, men reject its author. In trampling upon the law of God, they deny the authority of the lawgiver. It is as easy to make an idol of, of false doctrines and theories as to fashion an idol of wood and stone. Mm -hmm. By misrepresenting the attributes of God, Satan leads men to conceive of him in a false character. With many, a philosophical idol is enthroned in the place of Jehovah, while the living God, as he is revealed in his word, in Christ, and in the works of creation, is worshipped by but few. Thousands defy, deify. deify. Thousands defy nature while they deny God of nature. Though in different form, Idolatry exists in the Christian world today as verily as it exists among the ancient Israel in the days of Elijah. The God, not that it incorrectly says capital letter God, uh, with the capital letter in the electronic version. Of many professionally wise men, the philosophers, poets, philopo politicians, journalists, the L lower case God, God again. Lower is, case. Incorrectly says God, uppercase, with the capital letter in the electronic version of polished, fashionable circles of many colleges and universities and in some of theological institutions is little better than I than Baal, the sun god of Phoenicians. Wow. Lynn White, Great Controversy, page three five eighty three verse uh, paragraph one. Okay. Multitudes have a wrong cons conception of God and its, his attributes and are truly serving a false god as, the, as were the worshippers of Baal. Wow. Many even of those who claim to be Christians have allied themselves with influences that are unalterably opposed to God and his truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. That's in Patriarchs and Prophets, no, page 177. Prophets and Kings. Prophets and kings. Excuse me, Prophets and you. <laughs> yeah. I want but, to repeat that part that's in bold there. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. <laughs> Do you suppose to some extent that people read the New Testament in light of the Old Testament rather than read the Old Testament, excuse me, read the Old Testament from what we've learned from the Gospels. In other words, learn the Gospels, learn the truth about God, and then go back and read the Old Testament. Yeah. Because the, the, you can get a, a really a distorted picture of God. But so many churches don't even, there is no Old Testament. But, but, they, but they're very legalistic or forensic. Mm -hmm. God, God has lots of power. And look out, man, but that's traditional thinking. You know, the, the old uh, thinking with Job was, hey, you, look at yourself. You're miserable, your finances are shot, and your health is, is gone. So it must, God, God must not be smiling on you. Yeah. And you, you, you did something wrong. You did something terribly wrong. Hell, hell is a very precious doctrine in, in most church, churches today, isn't oh, it? Yes. Because it gets people to part with their fire insurance premiums. They call that <laughs> offering, excuse me. <laughs> Okay. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. 
It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. Can I interrupt there for a second? We started out at the beginning saying the work of Jesus when he came to this earth was what? To manifest the character of God. Yes, to correct the misrepresentations of God that had been right. perpetrated by Satan mm -hmm. and to give us a correct picture of God. So what are we, what are we seeing here? Not so that we, uh, this little world here, might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. It was to do what? The vindication of God. Yeah. His character. God. Before the entire universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. John I'm, 12, I'm, 31 and 32. Yeah, thank you. I want to interrupt again for right there. If you read the King James Version, there's a word that was left out there. What's the word that's left out? That's left out here. That is in the King James. But, but in the King, the older King James, it was in italics. Yes. And it was not for emphasis. It was to show that it was added. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, back about 19 years ago, I was back at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Dr. Bruce Metzger, the general editor of the of the uh, Revised Standard and the New Revised Standard chose that as an uh, as an example of Bible translating, mm -hmm. and they added the word "men." I, uh, I, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And I raised my hand at the back of the room and I said, "Maybe it would have been better if they left the word "men" out, and that it then it would have been more in keeping with what Paul says in Colossians one nineteen and twenty and Ephesians one nine and ten is that Jesus' death was for the benefit of the all the heavenly beings. Went over like a lead balloon. They didn't know what were you because talking about. it didn't fit their paradigm. We like we talked about earlier. You see, we everything we learn comes from the filter of our past experience. Well, you know, unfortunately, they weren't the only ones that made that kind of mistake. When we print the new yeah. revised Desire of Ages, or is this 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 is no, it's Patriarchs and Prophets. Print the new printing of Pro oh, we have to be faithful to the King James. Put the men back in there. This paragraph, it's not about doing things for men. It's all about what? Before the universe. Oh, before creation. the universe. All of creation, the heavens. That I, I, th that's business about that God was to, to or we were to vindicate God's character. Some uh, years ago on uh, LLBN, a couple of people that you and I know, uh, uh, one of them says, uh, or this earth experience is to vindicate the character of God. And the other one, who's a professor at, at the, uh, here at the university, said, no, that isn't true. Uh, the other fellow, it, another person, like I said, we, we both know, uh, he kind of made his point, so he kind of backed off. But that, that's the, what we're stuck with, yeah. misinformation on the part of the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Okay, so the bold part, Diana. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all of the universe, it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the per per perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. So, Patriarchs and prophets, got go. that one right, page 68. Okay, so let me ask you the question. What did the heavenly angels learn about God from the experience of Jesus living here on this earth. What, what, I mean, they live with God. They live with Jesus for thousands, of, who knows how long, thousands of years. They could have gone to ask him a question any time. So what, the act of Christ in, Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, or in other words, our salvation, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son, they're dealing with the rebellion of Satan. How does the death of Christ justify God in dealing with the rebellion of Satan? I don't think they understood the, what was at stake. So that thou, or God, may be justified 
not to men here alone, but the whole universe. Mm -hmm. um, you see, I think it quotes, we quote Psalm somewhere, that was, that's what it first said, thou thy God may be justified, then... Uh, Psalms 51 is, and is quoted in Romans 4. Romans 4, there you go. Romans 3, I'm sorry. 3, yeah. verse 4. Yeah. Right, right. Vindicated, yeah. the word. Yeah. Uh, Emily, clinically, if we have the time, is to say that uh, uh, half of the angels doubted, but uh, then the, uh, the one third of the one that fell, but the others saw the mm. beauty. John 12, M four. Might have, is that John 12, I mean, four? Revelation 12, Revelation. 4, excuse yeah. me, Revelation 12, mm. 4. So, how does that establish the perpetuity of the law? Because that's what our lesson subject is, is bringing up here, the perpetuity of the law. What does that have to do with this? It, it's always there. What does it's, perpetuity it's, it's, mean? Never ends. Never ends. Yes. We, again, uh, if we had time, we would look at all those quotations. Ellen White says in several places, we will spend the rest of eternity studying the plan of salvation. And what will we learn? From the death of Jesus, well, the life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. This is the simplest way I know to put it. We can choose to live a life following his life, or we will die as he died. Choose his life, or choose his death by default. So, okay, well, thank you very much. One more sentence there. Ah, the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 595. Very good. So look at Seventh-day Adventist education. Are we following God's guidelines when making our classes in science, history, and morality, even cultural ideas, fully based on our biblical worldview? How, how, how do we do that? There might have been a time. Yes. Things are oh. starting to change a little, apparently. Not a little. <clears throat> It's painful. To, to it's very painful. Yeah. It's creeping in, might have been a good time. And it's not only here. I think it's a worldwide phenomenon. That's the yeah. sad part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Finally, you know, in the United States, the, I don't know what they do in the other parts of the world, but the biblical is, there has no effect. In, and, and they're countering it with so much utter negative I information and, and of, of, as matters about God is like a vacuum. And you, how many generations you've got that? Yeah. You've been doing that at least three or four. Right. However, it's um, it's good to know that young people, young people, uh, places in this country and all over the world, who are really going back to uh, basic Christianity. There is a primitive, mm -hmm. primitive Christianity. There is hope. I mean, the, uh, God's word cannot fail. Yeah. God's I had the, an interesting experience this week. I was working with a young woman from the Middle East, but a Christian from the Middle East. And she said, what do Adventists believe? Hmm. Hmm. And you wonder, how much can you say in a few minutes? <laughs> you know, yes. That's a tough one. In between, uh, in between patients and so forth. Wow. Wow. Well, can you think of any example? When, when, when I was done, she, is, she said, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. She has just come here from attending a completely, uh, 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 you know, secular university for her medical school, and now she's come here starting her residency program here. And so what do Adventists believe? Well, how do you know that this is not going to culminate into something like... Uh, uh, the young lady that you that asked you uh, yeah. in a in a oh, yeah when I was at Johns Hopkins Johns University. Hopkins right right uh, yeah and the party of all places yes and she ended up coming here and teaching uh, at yes. the university so you can never tell yeah never tell how anyway but all you can do nowadays is give them, give them the website yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do you don't have time to to yeah. have a long discussion. You can't do it on, say, Sabbath morning, we meet together. Yeah. Can you think of any example when an entire educational system has turned out to be very destructive by departing from God's law? Mm. Think of what happened in the French Revolution. Oh, yes. 
us. Oh my word. Trying to turn the state into a religion. What we think as a state, that's that takes the place of what God says. What about Nazism? The Holocaust? Yeah. Communism and the millions who died under Stalin and Lenin. Think about evolutionary theory. Well, right now they will, New York will be voting on whether to um, eliminate history mm. in their entire curriculum for the entire state. So if you have no history, you have evolutionary theory in your science, there's not much left. Why are they trying to eliminate, can't live in a, eliminate history? Well, they're completely. talking about across the, the whole United States. But New York has already decided that they're going to, to put it. They don't have time to talk about history, huh? Um, I, they want to change history. They want, they, want, they want to rewrite history, huh? Yeah. So if you eliminate it. Oh, brother. And isn't that what Marx said? Didn't Marx say God. that when you eliminate your history, yeah. you die as a people. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're even, I had one or two pieces of mail come through recently. They're actually starting to teach and or want to teach it, Islam in Ukaipa schools. Mm -hmm. we, I, and if you think of some of the phases we're seeing in Congress right now with what's coming up, we even have one of our new ladies there, she's an active Muslim. Oh yeah, there's two, there's two of them. And uh, regards us as enemies. Now how did she get into that? At that, uh, it's, it's just incredulous. Nobody is checking on what's going on much, apparently. I'll add my two cents. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at Hegelian dialectic at the fullest force ever. Okay, and it's going to swing to a, this is what we tell you, and it could come from the good th thinking Christians. So, this is it. Look at what's happening. The pendulum is going to swing and it's going to stop and we're all going to be controlled. Mm. And we, we're living in the very exciting time of the world's history. Yes. Well, that, like Richard yeah. Zietz said, what, about 40 years ago, there it goes, he says, uh, the time of the end, a great time to be alive. <laughs> yeah. how, far, how far can we go? Uh, well, we Did, are we seeing control coming in? Oh, very, very much so. COVID, COVID itself is a big jump. Yeah. Big jump into total control. Anyways. Wouldn't it be all right if we could get every person just to do what he believes is right, according <laughs> to his own conscience? A philosopher from the philosopher from the 18th century once wrote, O oh, conscience, conscience, thou divine instinct, thou certain guide of an, ignorant and of an ignorant and confined, though intelligent and free being, thou infallible judge of good and evil, who makes man to resemble the deity. Mm. What's wrong or right with that position? <laughs> Are all men's consciences safe guides? <laughs> <laughs> Are the people walking our streets even what are regarded as civilized nations who believe that it is all right to kill others and take what belongs to them? That's what's it, 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 What you're seeing, what I'm seeing more and more, every time something happens that gives a chance to cause some civil unrest, then what do people do? They're busting down buildings, they're burning buildings, they're burning cars, they're grabbing stuff out of stores. And they don't want to do anything about it, a lot of them. You see, but the Hegelian dialectic, you, you watch what's going to happen come November. It's, I think it is going to be, um, everything is going to be under control, you see, but we are, our freedom, we're going to lose freedom. What did Benjamin Franklin, I think, says, he who gives up um, for security, for security mm -hmm. is not worthy of yeah. either freedom or security. You won't have either one. Right. Yes. And if freedom is not free, free men are, are not equal, and equal men are not free. That's a phrase I learned some years ago. Yeah. It's okay. Every day as you go about your business, do you often think about your paradigm or worldview? Does your worldview really matter? A survivor of Buchenwald and Auschwitz, mm -hmm. and I, we could go on, I've been to Treblinka, I've been to Dachau, I've been to Auschwitz a couple times. 
the Nazi extermination camps which were dedicated to eliminating Jews, political dissidents, gypsies, and other undesirables, said these words, if we present a man, um, actually, I think that's yours. If we present a man with a concept of man which is not true, we may well corrupt him. I became acquainted with the last stage of that corruption in my second concentration camp, Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate sequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment, or, as the Nazi liked to say, of blood and soul, a soil. I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka and Maidenich, were ultimately prepared not for some ministry, not that is a, some. not prepared in some ministry, that is a department, or other in Berlin, but rather at the desks and the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers yep. by Viktor Frankl, Doctor and yep. the Soul. Yep. <clears throat> Could something like the Holocaust ever happen again? <laughs> it's in the making. Yeah. It's in the making. Yes. They don't need to have camps to do it. They, you can do it on the streets now. Yeah. Yep. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to on a Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, <coughs> will yield to the popular demand of a law-enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. In the soon coming conflict, we shall see exemplified the prophet's words, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. That comes from the Great Controversy, page nine, 592, paragraph 3. I, I just needed to say yeah. something. We don't have much time, but... Uh, Praise be unto you. What, 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 that's in Latin. Um, praise be unto you. This is mm. this is the Pope himself saying, mm -hmm. uh, Pope Francis, the Lord or the something. But uh, this was in uh, in 2017, and exact same thing. He says um, we have to save the uh, environment. To do that, we need to turn off the lights. We need to turn off the air conditioner. That we don't need. We need to. Um, these are good things. Uh, we need to uh, share our vehicles with others. Okay, and the ones who are not going to follow with us, we're going to boycott them. Finally, we need one day of family day. Yeah. Okay, that day is Sunday, and he said so. You see, and so we're just waiting for the time. We're going home. All of that is uh, <coughs> evidence of the beast, which is yeah, force. Right. All everything to do with force, and right. this all this business we've got over the last five or six months yeah. is force, which is six, six, six. Control. Evil, evil, evil. The ultimate evil, three times, and and when you got to have something over your face, something on your hand, that's the ultimate evil because it comes via force. Right, right. Not choice, from logic. And that's it's what from Satan force. has done. Satan yeah. wants to, you know, he comes in but on control. There is no choice. Yeah. Right. I, it, but love and, and freedom, so forth, and God is love, so forth, uh, mm -hmm. First John uh, 4, 8. 4, 8, 4, 8 and 16. Somebody uh, says, I don't tell, talk my, to my nephews. They were talking about their nephews. Don't teach them that uh, God did, wouldn't do this, God wouldn't do this. They use the term, love wouldn't do this. They're teaching somebody's nephews, okay? I would love wouldn't do this. I thought that was, that was neat. And is, many times you can just, instead of God, you substitute the word love. Does it make sense? Does love, do, we use our logic. Anyway, I just, I want to interject that there. Okay, <clears throat> Gary? I think I finished mine. You're thought. finished, okay. Yeah. Yes, um, oh, it's, it's lovely to see. Yeah. Praise be unto you, Lord, to see. Okay. You have got to Google this. It, 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 praise be unto you, or Lord, to see. You you Google that. It's, it's, it's interesting. And yeah, that day, we're living in that day now. We need to. We, we're living in that day. We need to keep rolling. Yeah. Conscience, obedience. 
to the word of God will be treated as rebellion. Uh -huh. Blinded by Satan, the parent, pattern, yeah. parent of oh, will parent will exercise that. harness and severity toward the believing child. The master or mistress will oppress the common keeping servant. Uh -huh. Affliction will be alienated. Uh, children will be disinherited and driven from home. The words of Paul will be literally fulfilled. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Second Timothy 3.12 All the defenders of the truth refuses to honor the Sunday Sabbath. Some of them will be thrust into the prison. Some will be exiled. Some will be treated as slaves. To human wisdom, all uh, this now seems impossible, but as the restraining spirit of God shall be withdrawn from men, and they shall be under the control of Satan, who hates the divine precepts, there will be strange developments. The heart can be very cruel when God's fear and love are removed. Great Controversy, Ellen White's uh, page 608. Paragraph 1. Powerful. Yeah. Persecution in its varied forms is the development of a principle which will exist as long as Satan exists and Christianity has vital power. No man can serve God without enlisting against himself the opposition of the hosts of darkness. Evil men, evil, excuse, angels. evil angels, will assail him. Alarmed that his influence is taking the prey from their hands, evil men, rebuked by his example, will unite with them in seeking to separate him from God by alluring temptations. When these do not succeed, then the compelling power is employed to force the conscience. Great Controversy, page 610. This is why world views matter. They can shape a reality in which light becomes darkness and darkness light where evil is good and good is evil. It is intellectually naive and narrow-minded to explain atrocities simply by calling the, calling the perpetrators monsters or some other dehumanizing epithet without getting to the core of why people do what they do. Many so-called monsters of history showed love to their wives and children, cracked jokes with their friends, bounced their giggling grandchildren on their knees, and proceeded to get up each morning to perform the day's atrocities. Mm. This is why worldviews matter, and this is why the answer to the psalmist's question, what is man that thou art mindful of him, Psalm 8, for, must always begin with in, with in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Is there any other religious or philosophical system that places a higher premium on human life than Christianity does? If we truly believe that we are all sons and daughters of God, could we have any higher worldview than that? There was once a famous debate between a Christian apologist, Greg Bonson, and an atheist, Gordon Stein, who said, Someone asked from the floor why Hitler's, Hitler's Germany was wrong. Stein, representing the atheist position, could come up with no better answer than to say that what Hitler did was against Western civilization's moral consensus. Basically, it was wrong because Western civilization had previously decided that behaviors of that nature, for example, genocide, were wrong. Within this moral worldview, if the decision had gone to the opposite direction for some reason, then all that was done by the Nazis could have just have easily been deemed moral. Remember, Gordon Stein is not some Nazi propagandist in the 1930s. He is a Jewish American scholar having a debate in the University of California, Irvine, USA, in the year 1985. Wow. Wow. Notice carefully that Stein's view based on atheism and the Nazi view based on the superiority of certain races do not recognize the intrinsic value inherent in every human being. Most people would admit that they subscribe to some kind of law keeping, but moral law given to us by God is not the same as other laws. In light of what we have studied here, is, is it not essential that we pass along to our children the necessity of strict adherence to God's law? 
This is not to scare them into obedience, since that never works anyway. Any foolish tyrant can come up, can make up some law and try to force others so, to force those under him, even on pain of death, to do what he wants them to do. Look at communist regimes today, but God's law inherently has many blessings connected to it. Carrie? Dr. Joel Hoffman brings out a rarely mentioned difference between the Ten Commandments and other legal codes. He offers an illustration of a conniving teenager who reflects on securing his financial future by marrying a wealthy older woman, <laughs> killing her and facing seven to twelve years of prison. He weighs the consequences. He would get out of prison at about 30 years old, but would be wealthy for the rest of his life. He decides it's worth it. Huffman then says that there is nothing in the entire body of American law that says you are not entitled to make that calculus. Nowhere does American law state that if you are willing to do the time, you still shouldn't do the crime. Hmm. This is where the Ten Commandments stand out in contrast precisely because they don't say specific consequences for disobedience. They are moral law, not legal law. Of course, later, these commandments also make up the legal code of the nation of Israel. But the commandments tell us what to do and what not to do, not in order to avoid certain specific consequences, but because God is communicating what is morally right and what is morally wrong. Something American law, and in brackets it says America is likely representative of other countries in this respect, doesn't do. Perhaps this is also why the Ten Commandments are not introduced as commandments, mitzvot, but instead as words, debarim, from Exodus 21. See Dr. Hoffman interpreting language. And if you get our, our handout, you can look up the actual thing here. It's, it's listed there. It's a YouTube uh, discussion. So what should we conclude? There are at least two reasons why the Christian worldview is higher than any other worldview. Charles? We are creatures who are sons and daughters of God. Therefore, we should follow his guidance and not someone else's. We have not only been created by God, but also he has a plan to redeem us and restore us to ethnic, Eden. in the Edenic living, first in heaven, then back on this earth. Is this not a good enough reason to follow his plan for our lives? What more could we ask for? Imagine living with a God of love who loves us that much. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these words of wisdom from your word, from the prophets, and from Ellen White. Help us to figure out ways, to think of ways, and to and to and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us so we may live according to these principles. Lord, your church on here on this earth is facing its its problems, its difficulty. Our world seems to be in total chaos. Uh, we know that all these things are an indication that we are approaching the end. So help us to be ready, is our prayer in Jesus' name.